In biology, life is defined by seven characteristics. Number one, growth. Things that are alive will grow and develop over time. Embryos grow to fetuses that in turn grow to infants. Children become adults. Number two, reproduction. Things that are alive will procreate, causing more things like themselves to be alive. The mechanisms of reproduction vary. Some organisms are sexual, others asexual. Number three, heredity. Things that are alive have their characteristics passed on from their progenitors and develop changes in them with successive generations. This change does not apply to a single organism, but to a species or subset of a species as a whole. Number four, homeostasis. Things that are alive regulate their own inner status. For instance, the human body tries to maintain a specific temperature Shivering and fevers are ways to up the temperature, while sweating is a way to reduce it. Life forms try to stay alive. Number five, metabolism. Things that are alive take in energy from external resources and expel waste products left over from the conversion process. In organisms, this is referred to as anabolism and catabolism. Number six, cellular. Things that are alive are comprised of cells, the basic units of biological life. Number seven, responsiveness. Things that are alive act in response to the environment around them. Humans do not sit alone in the dark, twiddling thumbs in complete idleness. They work, they play, they eat, they run, they fight. Life forms cause action. To determine if something is a life form, according to biology, it has to meet these criteria. Some things, like viruses, are close, but not quite there. They cannot take in their own energy. They must obtain it from a host cell, part of a living organism. In a sense, they are the smallest parasites possible, preying on the smallest forms of life, cells. Suppose the biology was taken out of the criteria for life. Remove all reference to cells, genetics, and organisms. What would remain? Things that are alive must still grow, reproduce, have ancestral traits, regulate themselves, take in external energy be comprised of miniature building blocks, and respond to their environments. What would non-organic life look like? In the 21st century, many who consider the possibility of non-organic life would immediately jump to the idea of artificial intelligence, AI. Computer science has developed by leaps and bounds, and there are parallels. Computers have grown. The earliest computing machines were enormous by today's standards, encompassing entire rooms just to do basic arithmetic. While unable to copy themselves, their makers have been relentless in producing them. The lineage of machines from Babbage to Turing, groundbreaking as they were, would be dwarfed by the line from Turing to Gates and Wozniak. 
With these successions comes heredity, as each new machine builds on the strengths of the previous. Once activated, computers maintain their own internal functions. Step away from one to return later, and it will still be running. They take in power from without, are made of millions of tiny transistors embedded in little chips, and finally, they respond to their users, their environment. However, for all their development, computers are not alive. Their continued existence relies on their makers, humanity. Without humans, there would be no computers. Thus, one may conclude that computers are a closer equivalent to an inorganic virus. They emulate many of life's features, but fail to attain full living status by reason of dependency. Are there any other possible inorganic life forms? Not at first glance. The closest contender would be ideas. Consider, ideas grow over time, from little kernels of inspiration to panoramic visions of the future. Ideas reproduce. Tell someone a story. That idea has now been replicated in the mind of the listener. Ideas are hereditary. When telling a story, the message is not perfectly transmitted. The listener will hear the same words, but each word will have a slightly, minutely different meaning. To the storyteller, the word blue may evoke images of clear blue skies on a sunny afternoon, but to the listener, it may tell of sapphire waters off a tropical coast. Ideas regulate themselves. Every human has an element of resistance to change. It takes argument and evidence to convince a human of a new idea, like an attack on a host's immune system. Resilient ideas remain, while weak ideas are forgotten. Ideas take in energy in more than one way. The idea's host must utilize energy to maintain brain power in considering the idea. And to create a new idea takes mental effort on the part of the imaginer. Ideas are all comprised of sub-ideas. A story is made of characters and events. Characters are made of traits and attributes while events are made of settings and actions. They, in turn, have sub-ideas, all filtering down to the most basic idea of all, being. Finally, ideas respond to their own environments. They do not do this directly, but by proxy. A host possessed of an idea will go to lengths to maintain their understanding of the idea, or to fulfill its purpose. A human, fearing for life, will run, pressed to action by the idea of survival. In some ways, ideas fulfill the criteria for life even more than computers and AI. However, they too fail to attain full living status for an idea cannot exist outside the mind of its host. Like viruses, they are dependent. Or are they? Each morning, the sun rises over the eastern horizon, beheld by billions. Its viewers find it beautiful. But suppose that all its viewers, human and beast alike, were to abruptly die no one would remain to see the sunrise. But would it not still be beautiful? Mathematics is humanity's best effort 
to understanding the language of reality. By number, variable, and formula, the universe runs its course. The minds of science, Newton, Leibniz, Einstein, Maxwell, Pascal, Fermi, Feynman, Pasteur, Mendel, Faraday, Hawking, and yet more, all worked to give us the language needed to understand existence. But did not gravity still pull before it was calculated? Did not geometry give direction and order to travel before Euclid? And didn't 2 plus 2 equal 4 before the first humans even drew breath? It was not the human mind that produced these ideas. Quite the reverse. These ideas sought out the human mind and embedded themselves within. No, backwards again. They brought the human mind into themselves. Ideas are alive, and we are their food. Thank you.